Hello and welcome into the Netson MMA podcast. I'm Andre Kachaturian, joined as always uh, with Manouk Akopian, a comeback sports journalist. His work has been featured in the LA Times, in The Guardian, and Al Jazeera. Manouk, how are you today? I am doing fantastic, Andre. Uh, nothing gets me March more. March Madness? How was your nothing, bracket? Oh, my, bra- my bracket is busted. Well, I don't do bra- I don't do brackets. It saves me the time and energy. Oh, just focus on combat sports, of course. Absolutely. Well, my I'm a, I'm a one trick pony. Right I mean, my bracket's actually doing pretty well right now, but nobody cares. Nobody cares. Let's let's go on to some UFC talk. Big week in uh, the UFC. Uh, Conor McGregor celebrating St. Patrick's Day in Chicago, dying the River Green, flying over to Boston later that night to go to the Bruins game. He was out here at TD Garden. He uh, dropped the opening face-off puck and then was interviewed by our own Nesson's Dale Arnold. So I'll go check out that interview on Nesson.com uh, and our YouTube page. Very very informative interview by Conor McGregor. And then he went on rally the, the Bruins in the locker room and then went on to, uh, what do you do after? Oh, yeah, the St. Patrick's Day Parade in South Boston. He was there to throw his proper 12 hats to all of the great Bostonians in this amazing city. And then, at the same time, he gets into a Twitter war with none other than Max Holloway. And Max Holloway invites McGregor at the end of this Twitter war to fight him in July. These two fought last time. That was actually Max Holloway's last loss was against Conor McGregor. Um, the, the fight happened way back in 2013 in Boston, Massachusetts. That was Max Holloway's last loss. Instead, he's uh, won one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen 12, 13 consecutive wins and is the current defending um, featherweight champion. What did you make of that Twitter exchange, Manuk, between McGregor and Holloway? Would you like to see them fight in July? You know, this is this is classic Connor just taking jabs at anyone who, who who's within arm's reach, distance away from him. You know, let, let's be honest here. Connor hasn't fought at 145 since 2015, and he, he was stripped of his belt in 2016. And quite frankly, he's he's going after bigger and better things in other divisions. He, I mean, he's calling out Anderson Silva for for crying out loud. So oh, come on, I, I, I mean, think. I think a Holloway McGregor fight would be the would be pretty big. I mean, we're talking big. about a guy who's won thirteen consecutive fights, who's already a champion in the feather. I don't think this fight would be at featherweight. Don't get me wrong. I think this yeah. would just be well. Holloway fighting uh, Dustin Poirier at UFC two thirty six for the interim lightweight championship belt, and assuming he wins that, he might have his sights set up for Khabib for the unify the belt. But I think this would just be a non title fight. Big money fight. Why, what's wrong with that in the middle of July in the international fight? Here's here's what I have. Uh, here's my gripe against that. How can someone call himself the king of 145 when he hasn't been anywhere near that in four years? That's like us calling ourselves the king of podcasts when we haven't recorded in four years. You can't do that. But, but Manuk, I'm not saying this will be in the featherweight division. I think this will be a lightweight, non-title fight. Well, uh, I, at that point, if if they do strike an agreement and come to terms, uh, Max Holloway is quite frankly one of the more entertaining fighters in all of UFC. Like you said, he ha- he has to avenge his loss to Conor McGregor because he's put on a hell of a streak uh, ever since that defeat in uh, 2016. So, uh, you know, Max Holloway, he's never he's never turned down a fight. He's never turned down a challenge. Highly entertaining. And quite frankly, a rematch would be more entertaining than the back and forth Twitter. But you know, I, I couldn't help but laughing when what, help but laugh when Connor was talking about leaving his ACL up uh, Max's ass. So that, well, yeah. that got a good, I mean, that got a good I chuckle think, out of me. I think that'll be a fantastic fight. Uh, it'll be. I think Holloway wins that fight. But, you know, again, but even if it's not for a title, why not? Just like there's money to be made here. Let's just do it. Um, McGregor, McGregor came out. And, yeah, Lippert I mean, came out called out McGregor. So I'd much rather see McGregor fight Holloway than to see the trilogy fight against Nate Diaz. I'd much rather see McGregor fight Holloway than a rematch against Khabib. We already saw McGregor Khabib. It was a mismatch. Khabib will win that fight again. And quite frankly, I don't want to see McGregor in the boxing and fighting Floyd Mayweather again. Let me just let me just say that. If there's one rematch I want to see, it's McGregor Holloway. It's been six years since these guys fought. 
It'll be exciting. People will like it. Um, and, you know, it'll make money. You're right, Andre. And quite frankly, McGregor had a busy week, too. Just picking shots at everyone. Took a shot at DJ Dillon, at TJ Dillon's shot, too. Called him a snake on Twitter. Yeah. So, so McGregor's well, has... For someone who doesn't like phones, McGregor's had a busy, busy week with the Twitter fingers. Yeah, yeah, he really has. That's a, uh, he went out and called T.J. Dillashaw a snake four years ago on the on the Tough Show, the Ultimate Fighter Show. He he called him a snake there, on that show as well. And now four years later, he says, "I told you all he was a snake." He called himself the new Saint Patrick. Um, T.J. Dillashaw, of course, suspended for a year after failing a recent drug test following his loss to Henry Cejudo in the, um, in the flyweight title fight. And um, this, this opens up a big... And he, of course, he relinquished the bantamweight belt after he got suspended. So now we have a vacancy in the bantamweight division, in the top of the bantamweight division. Um, I don't know what's going to happen there. Nobody knows yet. But I do see Henry Cejudo, he had his eyes set on being a double champ. Now it makes things uh, kind of easier. You might have to... Maybe Cejudo fights a guy like... Um, Marlon Moraes, who's actually on a tear right now. He's on fire. I'd love to see him compete for a belt. Um, that'll be interesting to see, but uh, what do you see what's happening in this dancing weight division? Well, uh, the Dillashaw news, as uh, as much of a shock it was, I really can't say it was a surprise. The tea no, leaves nothing a surprises bit. me when it comes to steroids anymore. Ever since yeah. the MLB steroid era, nothing surprises me. The, the tea leaves have been there on Dillashaw for a while. If you remember his ex teammate turned bitter rival Corey Garbrandt, he accused him of taking of, of taking the juice back in 2017, and you know uh, it, the, it's been there for a while. And the statement that T.J. Dillashaw put out, it sounded like he was pretty guilty. It, it wasn't like we're, we're going to fight this and we don't know what happened and we're going to blame GNC for this or anything like that. It, he sounded pretty. Uh, he sounded uh, pretty much guilty from that statement, from what I interpreted. So, um, as far as the division goes, obviously Dillashaw is a, is an all action fighter. We love seeing him in the cage, but uh, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to wait and see what Mr. Dana White has in store. Um, but by the way, Andre, if you were to take a test, what kind of adverse finding would we find from you? Um, hmm. I don't know. I don't, I, I, I don't. I, I don't, don't. I only take uh, the Advil and I take a lot of antacid lately. Uh, it, it comes very good. Um, I know you're big on emergency. I do take a lot of emergency to uh, get a lot of vitamins. But I, would that show up on a drug test? What's that again? Would that show up on a drug test? What would? Emergency. Oh, no, no, not at all. No. no I, I, there will be nothing adverse. I'm very clean. No. Uh, podcast host for the United MMA podcast. <laughs> and with that, let's um, set our sights to this weekend's uh, main event fight at UFC Fight Night Nashville. The UFC returning to the Music City for the first time in two years. The fight is headlined in a welterweight showdown between Anthony Showtime Pettis and Steven Wonderboy Thompson. Anthony Pettis returning to the welterweight division for the first time. Since 2008, Manuk, what were you doing in 2008? What was I doing in 2008? A, a, a lot of regrettable decisions in college. That is definitely oh. for sure. I was making regrettable decisions in high school, but here we, here we are, uh, cleaned up our act, talking about this fight. Pettis uh, competed in the lightweight and featherweight division since 2008. Of course, he was the lightweight champion in 2013. And then they competed for the interim belt at UFC 206 in the, in the featherweight division and lost. He's three and six in his last nine fights. As for Wonderboy Thompson, one, two, and one in his last four fights. He's hit a little bit of a rocky road. Could it be Tyron Woodley in two events, both of them for the welterweight title fight? And he most recently lost to Darren Till in his last fight in May 2018. Um, Thompson and Pettis. Uh, Offshark has his, has uh, Wonderboy as a heavy favorite, minus 390. Pettis, the plus 290 underdog. Of course, Pettis is moving up a weight class in the welterweight division. Wonderboy Thompson has a reach advantage and a height advantage. How do you see this fight playing out, Manu? Obviously, this is this is the classic case of a fighter moving up, a fighter who was one of the pound-for-pound pound best at lightweight and featherweight. Now he's moving up to 170 for the first time. So now he's the smaller man and the underdog and the man with the, 
with the size and reach disadvantage. But Anthony Pettis is one of the most flashiest strikers USC house to offer. Like you mentioned, uh, Thompson, Wonder Boy Thompson's last four fights haven't been too great, one, two, and one. So um, I'm actually surprised the, uh, of those numbers you mentioned at Oddshark. I don't see Pettis being that much of an underdog in this fight. I know he's alternated wins and losses in his last seven fights. Nothing to be, uh, nothing to be proud of really there. Uh, he's obviously known for the, one of the most miraculous highlights in, in MMA history with his flying kick to uh, Benson Henderson. But I don't really see Thompson manhandling him as, as much as most prognosticators and our MMA media colleagues are projecting to be. So I'm actually going to pick Anthony Pettis for this fight. He's going to win it on the ground. He's going to use that. Uh, he's going to use the cage in his favor and, and really compensate for his reach disadvantage by going in there with some really, really precise strikes. I have to, you know, you took all the words out of my mouth. Uh, let me just add, uh, add on to that. And I'm glad you mentioned going to the ground. I think Pettis might have to rely on that in this uh, in this fight because of the the height disadvantage. And Pettis, you know, like don't discount him on the ground. The guy. Uh, you know he can win some fights on the ground as well. He has, I want to see, he has, I want to see six submission victories in his career. Let me double check that. But I like double check that. Let's also ma- mention the Pettis' losses. Yeah, sure, he's lost six of his last nine fights. Um, but wait, as you check, he has eight submission victories. Eight of his twenty-one victories have come on the, uh, via submission. So I, 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 you know, I can totally see him uh, taking Wonder Boy to the ground here and finishing off the fight there. And I, I am also surprised that the odds are what they are. I'm going to take Pettis in this one as well. Look at Pettis' losses as of late. You know, one of those losses, Max Holloway, current champion. Another one of those losses is against Robert Whitaker, current champion. Another one of those losses, Dustin Poirier, who will be fighting in an interim title fight soon. And then two of those losses, Eddie Alvarez, former champion, and Rafael Dos Anjos, former champion. So five of those last six losses are against either guys who've been champions or are fighting for a title right now or are um, currently champions. Current champions, former champions, or fighting for itself. Basically what I'm trying to say is Pettis loses to guys who are at the top of their game. Maybe Pettis isn't at the top of his game anymore, but hey, neither is Wonderboy. The guy's 36 years old. Uh, he's, has a, he's only won one fight in his last four. I'm taking Pettis in this one. He's got the ground advantage, and I... I just see him, maybe if it was against a guy who's at the top of his game, he wouldn't have won. But you know what? Pettis' last three wins against Jim Miller, Michael Chiesa, Charles Oliveira, three guys who maybe aren't like the best in their divisions and whatnot. So I'm going to take Pettis as well. You're right, Andre. I mean, the way the, the, way the odds are put after this, one, it's, make it, it's making it seem like Thompson's the three seed and Pettis the 14 seed, and there's no chance whatsoever for this to – really turn out in Pettis' favor. But like you said, if Pettis... Very timely has, reference ceremony with the March Madness tournament. Oh, you know, that's why they paid me the big bucks. But uh, what I'm saying is, is that Pettis also has the chance to win this on the ground. And Thompson, like you said, he's no spring chicken anymore. And uh, although his record still, still stands strong at 13-3, and three, he's, like you mentioned, 36 and the number three contender in the division could have a bad night Saturday night, and I'm going with Pettis. I agree. And uh, you mentioned Thompson's, uh, you know, Thompson has a kickboxing background. He has uh, uh, seven of his 14 wins have come via knockout, uh, but the other six were decisions, only one submission victory. I, feel, I have a feeling Pettis gets his fight to the ground and wins it there. And once, he, once, once Thompson gets to the ground, I think he'll be in trouble. Anything and, else you would like to add, Mr. Akopian? Yeah, well, how do you feel about that song, Tennessee Whiskey? Like, I mean, Anderson. that's where the fight's going to be. It's going to be in Nashville. It's gonna be, that's going to be a fun night in Nashville. You go, you, go to the, you go to the fight, fight ends, and then you're already, you know, on some your third uh, whiskey soda and maybe a couple Bud Lights, and then you hit the town on broad, Broadway and go to some country bars, yeah, honky tonking, you know. It's, it's Tennessee what, Tennessee's been really spoiled this month. First, they get Ryan Tannehill as a backup. Now they get this huge fight night. I mean, and hey, uh, don't forget about the uh, Tennessee Volunteers, number two seed in the March Madness. 
So uh, a lot of good times. And what's Tennessee's nickname? What, what state is it? So California is the Golden State. Massachusetts is the Bay State. What's Tennessee? I'm I'm really not so sure, but I the, there's a corny pickup line with Tennessee. The Volunteer yeah. State. Come on. Ah. Uh, you need uh, that. I'm a, I'm a Calif I'm a California boy, born and bred. So, uh, good l good luck with uh, trying to get me uh, to get uh, what the what the cut what the state flower is for Tennessee. I wasn't talking about the state flower, but anyway, that's all the time we have for today. Manuka Kopian, thanks so much for joining us, breaking down the latest news in the MMA world and UFC Fight Night Nashville. We'll see you next week. Thank you very much.